You were WWE Tag Team Champion with André the, G the Giant. Right. How was that, being a, t a tag team partner with such a legend? It was an honor, you know, for me to, to be his partner, you know, and André, as you all know, just like he said, you know, was a legend and still is today with his name all over the world, you know, everybody knows, especially in wrestling, uh, or with the movies and stuff like that. Yeah, it was great, you know, and uh, it was a good, uh, great experience. Did you travel with him? Yes. Was it tight in the car? <laughs> yeah. No, because, you know, the WWF then, you know, always provide, you know, a big van for him or, you know, so. But in the uh, airplane, yes, it was tight in the airplane, you know, of course, with the first class, but still, he's a big man, you know, do, it's comfort there. Or, you know, some of the, um, airline don't have first class so they have to have the whole um a, a row like the, the, yeah, <laughs> the whole row for him you know three you know so you know with me i'm just sitting right beside him or, or sit behind him or yeah uh what was his appetite like was he seriously a big eater or <laughs> Have you noticed anything, any stories uh, of a big meal that was like extremely impressive? Well, um, you know, with him, he likes, at the time we were tagging up, he likes to eat and he likes to drink, you know. So, you know, I don't know if I should say it was uh, European style anyway. Yeah. You know, like your wine, you know, like your, and of course, after the meal, you know, he always said, you know, Tom, we had to have the fr French connection, <laughs> the French connection. You know, he had that two liquor that, you know, mixed together and we had, uh, drank that after meal. But yes, uh, not that, you know, like everybody see how much he drank or eat, you know, but he was eating every day and, you know, of course, uh, he eats. He eats yeah, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and drink a lot. And drink. Where did you first meet Andre the Giant? Because I understand you two were fairly close. Uh, the first time I ever met Andre the Giant uh, was when I d decided to get into professional wrestling. Uh, he came to Texas and he was wrestling in San Antonio and I had to referee th his match. And, and uh, I, I just, uh, you know, they didn't smart me up. He, even as a wrestler, they didn't, they didn't smart me up. And, you know, I was scared to death of Andre. But uh, we became close. Uh, then w when I went to Atlanta and, and uh, he flew into, you know, into Atlanta to, to do a, all the battle royals, he would do like two or three weeks of battle royals uh, in Atlanta. Uh, only told me to go pick him up at the airport. Uh, and I had a little Granada, and I picked him up, and I picked David Von Erich, who was about six 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 seven, and Andre was in the front seat, and my my little Granada had bucket seats, and Andre gets in the car and he leans back and he breaks the, my my seat, so I ended up having to trade my car in. Uh, but uh, if Andre liked you, he liked you. If he didn't like you, I mean, he you'd know. Uh, and, and he liked playing cards with me, and, and I enjoyed playing cards with him. We played gin rummy, or we played cribbage, and uh, you had to keep uh, Andre entertained. Did you ever go out with him to eat or drink? Yes, I did. Yeah, uh, but I didn't try to keep up with him. <laughs> <laughs> what was the most uh, you ever saw him drink in a sitting? Because we've heard many stories over the years. Well, I, I didn't experience it, but I heard that he had 116 beers. But if, if you see him hold the beer, it looks like a shot glass, you know, in, in his hands. I mean, he, his hands were like, I mean, they were like uh, catcher's mitts, you know, like a paw, you know. And uh, he was a big man, and you know, and and you know, he could he drank all the time. I, from what I understand, later on, Arnold Scolan in, in New York. Uh, I found out that the reason he was uh, 
the reason he was drinking so much is because he was in so much pain. You know, I didn't realize, uh, you know, how, what what his body, the change of, of his body with, with the disease that he had was going through. But uh, supposedly it was pretty painful. Would they allow him to drink in the dressing room in those days? Would it be no big deal if he wanted to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Andre could do it, whatever he wanted to do. I mean, he. But I mean, the guy was a businessman. He 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 always went in the ring. He was always there, uh, and and he always performed. Is it true that he really held something against Big John Stud? Uh, I I I just know for a fact that uh, I remember we were uh, doing the TV taping, and the, the, one of the top matches there was the Andre against John Studd. They had, they had a feud going on. Uh, the, you know, the Giants, I, 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 from what I understand, I heard rumors. I don't know if it's true or not, but, you know, he wasn't too happy when John Studd started going in the ring, you know, climbing the top rope, you know, because up until then, Andre was the only one who ever climbed over the top rope. Uh, but man, I, I remember Andre, you know, having to finish and, and, uh, chasing John Studd. And I mean, John Studd would go through the locker room and he'd keep on running, you know, he'd, he'd leave the building. <laughs> you know, he, he <laughs> Andre wasn't anybody to mess with. I understand that it was Andre that got you your job in the WWE for your long run that you had there. Well. I was in. Uh, I, I started out in Georgia. I went to Charlotte. Then I went to Amarillo, Texas. That's where I went to college. And, and they, uh, Black Jack Mulligan and Dick Murdoch promised me they were going to give me a big, big uh, push and make me an intercontinental uh, star. And when I get there, uh, by that time I had been in the business, uh, you know, close to two and a half, three years, but I knew the business. And my first TV taping was against Stan Lane. And uh, he was also coming in new and Dick uh, Mulligan wasn't there. And I believe Mulligan did want to give me a big push, but Dick Murdoch was a baby face and, and uh, he probably wanted to make sure that I didn't get over. So I go on my first TV taping and they make me, he made me and Stan Lane go 10 minute draw. And I realized, I said, if they're going to give me a big push, 10 minute draw on TV with an unknown, you know, it's not the way to go. It, you know, I only lasted about two months there. And Andre came by uh, again, like I said, he Andre would come in and, and, and business would, would, would pop because he would start doing the battle royals all, all over the place. And by that time, I had become close friends. Whenever Andre would, would be around, he'd travel with me. I would pick him up at the airports. I would drive him around. I'd hang out with him at night. Uh, he even stayed in my apartment, and I let him sleep in my bed. Uh, I told Andre that I wasn't happy, uh, that they were treating me like crap and lying to me, and you know I wasn't happy there. And I had no idea that uh, him and Mario Savoldi uh, uh, gave him a tape, and he brought it to. He was on his way to New York. I didn't even know that. Uh, and he showed uh, he showed Vince Senior a, a tape of me. So, uh, as you know, in this business, this business is very hard to make it. But it's who you know. You know, if if you have somebody that that has power and 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 can can you know can help you, you know, that's the easiest way you're going to make it. You know, uh, it's very hard to make it totally on your own. And Marco wants to know how you liked working with Andre the Giant. Loved it, loved it, brother. I worked against him, of course. Uh, I worked with him as tag team, me and Bugsy. McGraw, you know, uh, six man. Oh, I've done it all, man. Uh, He's he just a, a real sweetheart. Um, you know, he's like a bear, man. I mean, he could just backhand you, man, like a bear. I mean, I'm sure we, years ago we wrestled bears, you know, bear man. And, and, and other, they had other bears too. You know, Nick Adams had a bear, and uh, Tuffy Tr Truesdale had a bear, and of course, uh, Dave McKagney had a bear. But um, we'd go around, and they stopped that. And uh, but um, we'd wrestle bears. But um, uh, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, uh, Andre, man, he was like a bear. I'm telling you, uh, you know, he he could he could just whack your brother and and you know just <laughs> knock your head off, man. You know, and uh, oh man, he I I got a uh, uh, did a uh, cover cover on one of the magazines back in the seventies, and and Andre's in the air and he's giving me the splash. I mean, in the air, and I'm laying there, boy. And you know he's gonna come down. He's gonna come down, brother man. He could have killed me, you know. But uh, yeah, no, no, he was great. He was great, um, you know. Uh, and, and he was in so much pain at the end of the year. He just, he just broke my heart at, at his end of career. And uh, uh, you know, but um, boy, I was there when he started in his prime, and when they brought him in, you know, from Montreal and came over from France, and um, and uh, so, so. It, just, just a, a gentleman, man, and, and uh, oh man, oh man, he he he, uh, he he could drink so much, brother, man. You know, he, years ago they, they had the beer bottles and, and and they were long neck, real long, and his hands were so big he would grab the bottle, and you couldn't even see nothing. And this is the big long neck beers. I'm telling you, it's unbelievable. And 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 he'd go like this, look like he was sucking his thumb, man, because you couldn't see what he's doing. But he's drinking that beer, brother. And oh, he, a case is nothing, man. Oh, Andre the Giant was my friend. He absolutely was. He, he <laughs> we got smashed one night in uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, and uh, I, there was no way in the world I could keep up. He, he must have drunk 11 or 15 bottles of red wine. And I was, I, I drank probably 20 bottles of beer. But I was, uh, anyway, we tried to get into his room, Jimmy White and I. And Andre was, he was as full as a tent. Well, I've got him under one armpit. We get him through the door. And as he's going, he lost balance. And he fell against the door jam, my head between his arm. And the door chair, he almost knocked me out. <laughs> we eventually got him inside and uh, got him on bed to sleep. And then I think I had a concussion for three days or a hangover, one or the other. <laughs> Did you ever uh, travel with him on the road if, if you got along with him? I know that he used to bring some of his companions along with him from time to time. Well, sure. I mean, you know, we, we we would always end up in the same place as far as, Riding in a car with him or anything like that. No, that that was reserved. Timmy White used Timmy White used to drive him, and he had a couple of his mates there, Frenchie and uh, um, other chaps. And you know, he was always well taken care of. He had an entourage that was he needed. You know, we we went to Sydney for WrestleMania three, and we were promoting WrestleMania three, and. We were staying at the Sheridan Wentworth five-star hotel in Sydney, and it was my birthday. And Andre bought dinner. You couldn't, you could never put your hand in your pocket when Andre was with you. Anyway, uh, after dinner, the question came out about dessert, and then about five minutes later, out comes this beautiful seven layer dark chocolate layer cake marsh icing over the top with happy birthday out back on it and i that, that just that was amazing absolutely amazing and we sat there and uh, between the four of us that were at dinner we uh, we ate the entire cake <laughs> Now, Andre the Giant was known for sometimes taking liberties with yeah. people in the ring. Did you ever see any incidents of that? <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. I uh, was a young guy when I started in Florida, and uh, this girl came to Jacksonville who I was seeing once in a while, and Andre saw her, and he said, I drove Andre up to Jacksonville and he was leaving the next day, flying out of Jacksonville. He said, boss, could you introduce me to her? So I introduced him to her. And Andre were friends and we traveled quite a bit. 
even though we weren't supposed to, I was a heel. Uh, John Studd was so afraid of Andre. He was working the territory at the time in Florida. And he'd be working with Andre, you know, especially in Orlando, because that would be the first day Andre would get in. It was a Sunday. He'd be drinking on the plane the whole way. He'd get a bottle of Crown Royal. And John was a very nice man, one of the nicest men you'd ever want to meet. And John would stand in the corner going, oh no, oh no, and squeeze his hands like this for about 40 minutes before he went out. And Andre would take advantage of him. But I don't know if this is uh, an excuse or if I'm making an excuse for Andre. What he used to do, John, was step over the rope like Andre during his match. There was only one giant, and he would pound John pretty well. Interesting. I never heard that. I did hear that uh, John was afraid of him, but yeah. I wasn't sure exactly why. He did. He was like that with Hogan too for a while, wasn't he? Who uh, uh, the giant? Oh yeah, when they first went to New York. And Hogan was a heel? Yeah, he didn't make it easy. I think they became friends in Japan. How did you get along with Andre the Giant? Loved Andre. Um, yeah, Andre was the type of person that if he liked you, he loved you. If he didn't like you, run. Plain and simple. Andre, um, he, he liked me because I ate all the time. He got a kick out of it. How he go, boss, you eat a lot. I like that. You know what I mean? Just that's how Andre was. I still remember one time. Um, this one was 330 pounds too. And I always flew Northwest Airlines because I was based out of Minneapolis. And I always I had a gold card so I could go first class everywhere I wanted. So I'm sitting in the first class. I'm tired, you know, for the night before. I had got up, got a big breakfast. I didn't want any food on the plane, you know, because it's a short trip. And there's like one seat left up in first class. Well, who comes on? Andre. I said, Oh, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> so <laughs> he comes over to the seat. He goes, boss, anybody in that seat? I said, no, Andre. Now, you know those big center things between the seats, the dividers in first class? He grabbed that with one hand. That's how big his hand was. With one hand, picked it up, pulled it out, looked at the stewardess and said, stewardess, can you take this? She's like, oh, my God. I've never seen this in my life, you know? And he sits next to me. I'm like, you got I'm afraid, I'm afraid the plane's going to flip to one side. There's so much weight on that one side, just with the two of us alone, you know. And uh, <laughs> go ahead, take off. I fall asleep. They bring some food out. And also, I'm sleeping. Also, I get this big chop to my chest. Oh, my God. His, his hand took, like, my whole chest. And he goes, boss, you want your food? I said, Andre, you can take whatever you want because I can't breathe right now. I mean, he, just, he chopped me so hard, man. It's, I mean, it was crazy and that stuff, you know, but, you know, that that's how Andre was and that stuff. Like I say, if, if he liked you, he loved you. If he didn't, run. Now, Macho Man was another guy that people seem to either have good or bad experiences with. I'm sure you may have wrestled him here and there. Uh, how was your experience? Um, Andre, I, I know, like I said, I never had an issue with Andre. I remember one time, I think it was Orlando, Florida, Royal Rumble, and Andre was going to be the one to throw me out. And I said, lovely. Now, of course, you know, back then I was young, so I was out. I was out all the time, and that's why I was out the entire night. We were in Atlanta the night before. Well, good old me has got to go out the entire night because I want to have fun. Not thinking about that, you know, I got an early flight, so I just went out, came back to the room, grabbed my bags, went right to the guy dang plane. And I slept, I slept my little bit on the plane, which was, what, maybe an hour ride going down to Orlando. Got down there, had to go to the building, and uh, <clears throat> all of a sudden they tell me, well, Andre's going to throw you out. And I said, oh, boy. Well, Andre came over and grabbed me. Oh, he threw me out all right. He gave me like a hip toss that I went over the top rope. I couldn't even grab the top rope to slow myself down. I had to do a flip in the entire air at 330 pounds and land on the concrete down below. Thank God I was able to land partially on my feet because I would have been dead any other way. I mean, he threw me so high. I, was not, I, I, I didn't expect that. He was just so powerful. He just tossed me like I was a little kid. I'm going to have to go back and watch that. Oh, yeah, you'll see him. He just, boom, and it's like, well, wow. <laughs> I was like, wow. 
I'm 330 pounds. He's tossing like I'm a kid. But you brought up Andre the Giant earlier. You must have a story or two about the legendary Andre the Giant who could drink more than any other human being I've ever heard of. Well, first of all, first of all, we didn't didn't like him at first. Uh, we were uh, wrestling in Tennessee, and we went to see Mr. Perfect and a couple of our other buddies that were wrestling for WWF at the time. And he was in the back. And when we went back, we said we're going to see Mr. Perfect, and you know. And he said, "Get out." And we said, oh, "Well, we're here to see Mr. Perfect. He's in front." I said, "Get out." And on the third one, he pushed the table out of it, stood up, he said, I just said, get out. Me and Sag never ran so fast in our lives to get out of the damn building. <laughs> so then, ever since then, I really, you know, disliked them. And then even when we were in WWF at the end of his run, he was overseas with us. And I went uh, the first night and partied with me, Undertaker, and, P and Piper took us to this Spanish wedding inside the hotel. Well, I missed the plane. and. <laughs> I missed everything. They left without me, so I had to buy my own plane ticket, flew to uh, Brussels, got, got my own cab fare, got in the back, thought I was late. I got in there, and the guys weren't even near you because Vince would never fly to that one town. He'd fly somewhere safer because there was only one flight to fly there, and if you would miss that one, that would miss screw up the show. So them guys weren't even there yet. So here they come. Everybody come in, and I'm sitting with my feet on the table, and. I'm here, and Sag goes, oh my God, not this year. And I think Andre saw that as this young kid, he went out, did his thing, but he's there the next day to perform and do his thing, ready to go, and a lot of respect there. So that night he called me over, and we called him boss. He said, you, come here. And I said, yes, boss, what's up? You sit down by me tonight. I said, yes, boss, whatever you want. He goes, tonight you drink with me. I said, okay, boss, thank you. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so he gets two beer, ordered two beers. He toasts them up to me. He goes, the name of this tour is Don't Be a Knob. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> So I laughed, and ever since then, we became good friends. I met his family in Paris and everything like that, and became good friends of him. And well, what a good guy he is, you know? There is a fan on here. You already talked about Andre a bit, but he wants to know what was your impressions of Andre when you saw him for the first time? Well, the first time I, I mean, when I first time I saw Andre as a wrestling fan, not as a wrestler, but uh, he came to uh, our little Spartanburg Memorial Auditorium and, you know, and when he came in the door, you could, all you could see was this big shadow and this back, uh, Back in the day when he had that gigantic uh, bush, I don't know, I guess you call it a bush, that big hairdo thing, you know, he was gigantic. And I saw him come through, you could see him come through the doorway and he just like covered the whole entranceway, you know, and it's like, oh my God. And then when he came to the ring, I was like second row, you know, ringside or whatever. And uh, you could basically the way the ring was, you look, you could see the feet right in front of your face and his foot was like, you know, like gigantic foot, you know, and his just the whole body was just so gigantic. I was just like taken aback at how huge this man was when you seen him in person. You see him on TV, he was like, yeah, you know, he looks big. But then when he seen him in person, it was like a whole, whole nother thing. That man was like truly a true giant. I mean, I felt when I was in the ring against him, I felt like I was a small little kid and I was, you know, six, eight, 400 pounds and I felt like I was a small child wrestling against him, but man, it was a, uh, wow. It was something to see. That's for sure. Did you ever eat with him? Because you seem like you could probably keep up with him if anyone could. At the <laughs> uh, I, you know what? I didn't know, you know, I never really knew Andre to be that big a eater. I mean, he drank quite a bit, you know, but eating wise, the only time I remember, you know, like I said, I didn't, we didn't travel with him or hang out with him, you know, after the shows or nothing. But I mean, I just remember one time in the dressing room, he had his little wine vat they'd set up for him and he'd ordered, you know, uh, eight filet of fish. I mean, I don't know if that's a lot, eight of them, but it, you know, they brought that in, but the darn thing looked like a little biscuit in his hand when he went to eat them, you know? So then, uh, when we went to, went to France, you know, we went to France on a WWF tour and he took us all out to eat and stuff and knowing I don't drink, you know, I'm not a drinker. And he 
you know, oh, boss, you got to drink beer with us. And so he bought a beer, but the beer was in a mug about the, you know, gigantic mug like this, you know, you have to drink beer. And then he, or, you know, made us eat uh, snails, you know, I mean, uh, that's not something I grew up eating. You know, I grew up, you know, eating cornbread and, you know, stuff like that. I didn't grow up eating snails, but it's Andre the Giant. He's paying the bill, so I gave it a try. I about threw up all over the place, but, you know, got to hang out with Andre the Giant. What the heck? But uh, but Andre, I do, and uh, this is one that when I tell people, I actually was just telling someone this the other day. It's To me, it, 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 I couldn't believe it. And, uh, and I love both these guys, but I couldn't believe our ego – we're getting people's way so bad. We're we're in a spot, you know. Andre would come in, you know, he's a novelty. And so, especially over there in Louisiana, they put him in these spot shows. Cause these people, I mean, unless they get a ticket to go see him, they're never gonna see him the rest of their life. And so it, it sells out, it packs the place, you know. The giant's gonna be there. So we go and uh it, it, we're in a six-man tag. It was me, uh, Dick Murdoch, and, and Orton Jr. against Junkyard Dog, Paul Orndorff. And, and Andre in a six man in a spot show. It should be like a cakewalk. We got a night off, you know, but no, no, we go. And so we go out there and we, we, we you know, we do the spots. We get the bay faces over and then, okay, it's time to get heat on someone. Now think about this. Who would you pick? You pick, are you going to be Orndorff or Junkyard Dog or Andre? And so, well, I figure Paul, because, you know, they're really pushing the shit out of Junkyard Dog. He's a, he's a key player here in the territory, right? He's a franchise guy. And so I said, well, well, I try to stop Paul. I nail Paul. He nails me back. I said, sell him. Up. I hit him. He, nailed, I suplexed, he jumps up, suplexes me. I shoot him over the top, go to throw him in the post. He picks me up, throws me. I go, fuck. I go, tag dog. So try dog, right? Can't get dog to sell. Finally, this is no kidding. Andre got so pissed because he, you know, he was a good worker. I mean, psychology was. He goes, tag me in. Just like you hear him scream in the corner. They tagged him in, and I'm in a ring. He goes, he grabs me, he goes, he, and he says, boss, back me in corner, load the boot, and let me sell. I went, what the fuck? <laughs> so, so I did, I kicked him, and he staggered out about two or three steps, and like that big old giant was, he goes, oh, he dropped to his knees, and he fell forward all the way down on his face. And start, Can you believe that we got eat on the giant and gave them a hot tag? <laughs> wow. This is totally, totally ass backwards. Okay, but when Andre came back, I could hear him chewing their ass out in the dressing room. He would cut all over them, which was bullshit. Ego got to him, you know. But I mean, yeah, at least psychology wise, brother, I could not believe it, you know. Did so, you ever get the chance to drink with Andre? Oh my God, brother. Yes, yes, I did. I, um, a lot of times it was one particular time, you know, when he would fly into a place if he liked you. You know, like like he knew me and Murdoch, and he'd go, I want Lenny to drive me. You know, because he knew I had a Lincoln or whatever. He, but not only that, he wanted he wanted you to. He had to he rent the car. He wanted you to drive him because you drinking partners. So, so Andre, I, me and Murdoch had been out drinking for the last two nights, and I was just hung over when Jackson, Mississippi. And that's where Andre flies in to start his two weeks. And I'm hung over as hell. And so I come out, and Andre's on the face side. And, and there's like a big uh, open uh, roll-up door between us where you the fans are. So, he, you know, back then it's kayfabe. And he looks at me he, like this. He steps back. He goes, boss, tonight, me, you. And he goes like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm waiting. I'm stretching out. and fixing to ring the bell because I'm in the semi. I get dog. And I'm like, oh, my God, he's stupid shit. I got a hangover. And he wants to go drinking again tonight. And I go, oh. I said, okay, boss, no problem. I came back, I, I got I took my shower and hauled ass back to Baton Rouge. And I went over to uh, to um, Black Bart's. He had a trailer rented on the, across the, the thing here in Baton Rouge. And I didn't even go to my own apartment. Andre found me. Brother, <laughs> he found me. I wish I never would have done that. He he made me drink. He took me, went to After Hours Club. And that last time, last thing I remember, he was holding a mug. And he's like, yeah, I don't remember drinking it. I was about to fall out of the chair. He said, never run from me, boss man. <laughs> you know, yeah, brother, he could drink, believe me. Did you ever meet Andre the Giant? I tagged with him for five years. Well, oh, you can wow. go on YouTube. 
Yeah, you can go on YouTube and pull it up. Uh, Brett Sawyer and Andre the Giant. Yeah. Nicest guy in pro wrestling. He died at 44 because his bones grew through his brain and out his, and that's what killed him is his bones kept growing and growing and just wouldn't stop. And that's how he died. Is it true he was very generous and would always buy dinner and stuff on the road? Uh, to be honest with you, he was never like that with me. He's always very humble. He'd want to get two, if it was over 300 miles or under 300 miles, he'd want to get a case of Budweiser and two bottles of vodka. And by the time you get to that town, he was had it all gone. <laughs> he could drink a lot, I can tell you that. But he was the nicest guy in the world. I ever, He's the nicest wrestler I ever met, I can tell you that. And uh, he broke my seat. And I, I told Don Owens, he was the promoter, and he was like, well, heck, go tell him to pay for it. I was like, you told me to drive him around and I'm tagging with him. You go tell him. He was just joking with me, but uh, he paid for it. But uh, Andre, I thought, was super nice. He always calls people boss. And I asked him, why do you call everybody boss? He said, it's hard to remember everybody's name. <laughs> In fact, um, Andre, Andre the Giant used to... Uh used to come in quite often and uh, it was just kind of cool seeing those two together because you've got andre and then you get you got andre and then you know my dad on his own was seven foot tall 350 pounds you know big big guy and then um you know andre's andre so but it was it was funny to look at them like you've got me and mini me um my dad being the mini me which was unusual did he kind of take care of you as you were getting into the business knowing you from a young girl andre you andre yeah no not well yes and no um kind of a wild story about that was on my first trip to europe um i andre was on the trip he was on the tour and uh, uh, I was going over there for the first time. And so Andre had told me, I think, I guess I had won the uh, title. So Andre t says, well, you know, you, uh, Robin, you're too young. I mean, too, um, you're too skinny to be champion. So his idea, he, uh, he thought it'd be best to put about 30 pounds on me. So. He says, uh, that's what we're going to do. And what I want you to do is I want you to, for every meal, I want you to come sit by me. Um, we'll, we'll meet for every meal. And um, we're going to make sure that, you know, we we get you beefed up um, on this trip. So, uh, I mean, I wasn't real thrilled about it, but as Andre, you're going to do whatever Andre says. So uh, the, the very first night we're there, we were at a, uh, a restaurant. We were in Italy and at a restaurant and we walked in and they had, you know, how you have a salad bar and you've got all the, all the, we call them fixings, you know, for the salads. Um, they had a seafood bar and, and I'm talking like exotic, like the octopus and just things I didn't even recognize. And I'm from Louisiana and then we eat just about anything. Uh, so uh they had all of this this stuff just hanging out and i was like oh man no no way if he heads for that salad bar i'm done there's just no way but um he actually didn't do that but he did order he ordered some fish and the first thing he did he uh they brought the fish they set it down it was the whole thing um and i mean i like my fish fried honestly and but there was this whole big it looked like it was just like uh, they just caught it, threw it on the plate. But the first thing he did was just pop out the eyeball and um, eat it. And I don't know. I I, I, I thought I was going to lose it right there. But I said, oh, ho, ho, ho. There was no way um, 
I could uh, even sit for another meal. So I took off. I actually kind of excused myself, went back to the hotel and uh, God bless him. I mean, he was so angry and uh, he wouldn't talk to me for the rest of the trip. So um, uh, I finally, okay, we finally made peace somewhere down the road, but um, yeah, you, you, it's not, it's not fun having Andre upset with you. But I'm sorry, I just can't eat eyeballs. Just can't do it. <laughs> yeah, I've heard uh, once you get on his bad side, it can take some time to make up with him. Oh yeah, yeah, because you can't you can't out drink him. You know, you can't even forget out drink him. You can't even last. You know, um, you can't even hang with him. Um, yeah, I mean, he was so his. I mean. I'm sure people have, you've heard that uh, everybody's heard, you know, what a big heart the man had. I mean, no pun intended, just he's a, a phenomenal person, but he did, he would get his feelings hurt pretty easily. And, um, and it would, he, it, you knew it, you knew it. If you, if you pissed him off or you hurt his feelings, you definitely knew um, what you're going to do. Don't piss off a giant. They always allowed him to drink, didn't they, in the dressing room? He was the one guy. Yeah, yeah. him and Lou Albano. You know, I, I, I never drank in the locker room. You know, I, 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 I didn't like uh, uh, wrestling drunk. Yeah, but you know, I did a couple of, there were a few exceptions. We were in uh, Las Vegas. And uh, we're supposed to wrestle at the Thomas Mack Center over at uh, UNLV. So we got in about 8 9 in the morning. And uh, so everybody's starving. So we go in the, 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 I don't know if casinos have them anymore, but the like lounge. Uh, bars and uh, what I mean by that you, you, they're right in the lobby right in the fucking lobby and so before you go anywhere uh, you can get a drink right there in the lobby but of course you know they have tables and they had a big bar and so we're at Caesar's Palace and they, they had just re redid the the uh, uh, lounge uh, bar. It was beautiful. And we were all thirsty. I think there were seven or eight of us. So we go in there. We all, you know, take a seat and everything. And we, uh, uh, everybody orders whatever they wanted, you know, you know, whether it be a, a hard liquor or, or a beer, whatever. So anyway, Captain America, Dick Murdoch, Dirty Dick Murdoch, the merciless bastard. He says, let's have a drinking contest. It's a fucking nine o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> and I said, Dick, I said, are you serious? He says, I think I can drink more beer than Andre can. I think that's my friend. Just, just turn that off. Put that fucking phone in, in a goddamn drawer or something. But, <laughs> but anyway, Murdoch, uh, yeah, we're all sitting down, relaxing. I bet I get Andre's at one end of the uh, circle there. So Murdoch stands up, Andre, I bet I can drink more beer in an hour than you can. And Andre looks at him and the, the, Murdoch, I don't know what the hell was wrong with him. He must have had a bunch of bennies in him or something. And so I says, well, I'll get in on this action. And uh, then uh, Dino Bravo did the same, Lou Albano, uh, 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 
Frank Valois, Andre's manager. Uh, he was 60 years old at the time. And uh, he's about 340 pounds, a big guy. But, you know, he's like 60 years old. So I didn't expect him to get in on the action. But he did. So anyway, to make a long story short, because this is a long story, started at 9 in the morning, and we didn't uh, have our last beer till 7.30 at night. And the matches started at eight. And so, <laughs> so it's quite obvious we weren't at, we weren't at uh, uh, the arena yet. And we were about 15 minutes away. So who in the fuck is calling? God damn. Is it your wife? Are you still married? No, no, I'm shit. I haven't been married for... God. Well, I had three wives. I remember that. And uh, then uh, 1988. So that's what, 30, 34 years ago? Christ, 34 years ago was the last time I was married. But anyway, so we start drinking. And then the, the, uh, manager of the uh, uh, special events, you know, he controlled the boxing matches and the car races, but whatever kind of special event that Caesar's Palace did, he, this guy uh, handled everything. He was a young guy. He was like 30 years old, big wrestling fan. So he comes in the bar. <laughs> he said, what's going on in here? I said, Dick Murdoch challenged Andre the Giant to a beer drinking contest, and that we're right in the middle of it. Oh, really? And I, I said, yeah. I said, uh, I think this is the main event situation. I think Caesar's Palace ought to pay for the beer. He says, I think so, too. So he has the bartender get a bunch of these little plastic uh uh, containers that people put their coins in when uh, they're playing uh, slot machines. I, I don't even know if they have those anymore. I, I mean, they still have slot machines, but everything's computerized now. So anyway, the bartender had these seven or eight uh, little uh, uh, buckets uh, behind the bar. Every time we order beer, he'd pop a bottle cap off and throw it in. What? That fucking phone? Is that my phone? What, 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 what? Fuck. No peace, Hannibal, I tell ya. But, uh, Anyway, I hope it's a ring rat. I hope it's one of the groupies that saw you at the convention today. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> what the hell would I do with her? You know, I have her stripped down. I did turn around circles. I said, that looks familiar, uh, lady. <laughs> I'm sure someone in there has a Cialis for you. Yeah, I guess, yeah. But, but, but anyway, yeah. Uh, after all those hours of drinking, I mean, we were all fucked up. <clears throat> and Frank Andre drank 117 beers. His manager, Frank Valois, drank like 70, 65 or 70. And here's this guy 60 years old at the time. And uh, I think I took third. And I drank 46, 44, 46, something like that. And Big Mouth, uh, Captain America, Dick Murdoch, drank like 40. He was like fifth. And uh, Lou Albano dropped out and went to the vodka. And uh, Dino Bravo drank quite a few. Dino drank about 
40. And uh, so I have like seven o'clock at night, uh, the manager came in and he says, well, he says, I can't count everybody's bucket up and here's the list. I wrote everybody's name down and that, that that's how we knew, you know, who won and who drank what. So uh, uh, we get uh, uh, somebody said, oh, Arnie Skolan called. I said, well, you told him that we're on our way. No. I said, well, why not? So anyway, we get the van, the van from the casino, from Caesar's Palace, and we all pile in, and uh, uh, we get over to the arena. We pull up in the back. Nobody there. I said, shit, is anybody in here? We go and turn that fucking thing off. God damn. I don't know. The phone's over with the fans in the comment section. But uh, so what happens when you get to the show? Oh, so we get to the show. We walk in the back. And I, I didn't know if anybody was there. We go inside, there's 19,000 people in there. We go in the locker room, Arnie, Arnie Skull and says, okay, guys, who's the, who's the wise guy that uh, pulled this bullshit off? I uh, says, well, it's Andre. And of course, Skull was uh, running the show and he eventually wound up being uh, Andre's manager after Frank Valois uh, retired. <laughs> he said, don't pull, don't pull that shit on me. And he says, uh, the show's already started. The show had started five minutes before. I said, well, we're all here now. I said, yeah, you're all fucking drunk. I says, no, we're just drunk. We're not fucking drunk. And he says, God, what the hell am I gonna do with you guys? So anyway, we're all, we get our bags unpacked and everything. He said, Patera, you're working with the giant tonight. I said, yeah, I know. He said, for TV, we need 15 minutes. I said, 15 minutes. Can we make it 10 or 12? No. I said, okay, okay. I said, well, Talk to Andre, uh, see what he has to say about it. I don't have to, uh, I just tell Andre he'll do it. I said, okay. I said he drank over 100 beers. <laughs> what? I said, yeah, he drank over 100 beers. I, I I didn't even drink half that many. I I drank a little over 40. Holy fuck. I, he said, okay, do your best. And uh, because it was still uh, uh, televised, 19,000 people in the place. And uh, to give you an idea how well we did, we went out there the next month and it was sold out again. <laughs> Skolman says, God, you guys killed me. Yeah, so yeah, we, we, we had a fantastic match. We had wound up going 17 minutes. We didn't teach, touch each other for the first 12. And uh, people wanted to kill me because, you know, I was the bad guy. But I liked being the bad guy. So that's how it was back in the day. Let's refer to your uh, body part as your breadstick. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's refer to it as that. Does that sound good to you? Let's oh. refer to it as, like an Olive Garden breadstick. Yeah, like put like uh, two of them breadsticks together and about the same, right. about almost the same length, maybe. All right, so two of these. Yeah, two of these together. We'll mash them up. Maybe yep. three. What do you think? Three or no? Just two. I think I think two wide. You mean? And All right. Well, uh, they're about so we'll, fourteen. They're pretty big though, Verge. I don't know, man. The length about fourteen, maybe. Okay, so you claim 
that you have the biggest breadstick in wrestling. Uh, that's what you've the biggest breadstick. I Virgil, think, that's a, that's a serious claim here. I think I had the second biggest. Oh, the second now. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. I think I think the first was always Andre the Giant. Oh, of course. Of course. That's not even fair though. Huh? You know? That's not even fair. I mean, Andre had a piece of meat on him, man. Did he? Yeah, I heard about it, okay? And then one time Andre came in the shower and he hit me on my back and said, what's up, brother? Uh-huh. I start backing up toward the fucking, uh, kept my, my, my ding-a-ling in the front and back up, <laughs> up to the, the shower head almost, you mean? Yeah. I said, what's up, man? He said, oh, brother. And his damn dick was like, it was swinging like an elephant trunk. <laughs> So he shut my ass up real quick. Always said, always told people was that Andre was king of the fucking shower. <laughs> okay, I was second on the. I was on the second on the on the list. All right, so you you're number two. We can we can correct that error. That you're not number one. You're number two because of course anyone's going to lose to Andre the Giant, right? Oh, he had a, he had a piece of meat on him, like it was like. It's like you ever see an elephant trunk? Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, like that. That's like Dumbo. It. Like Dumbo. Andre uh, was a had a big heart, and he was a wonderful person to know. And if he if he liked you, and if he didn't like you, if he liked you, you were not going to be in trouble. But if you he did something that you didn't like in his life, he would quiet you down throw you around and keep doing that to set a message to you there's a fan on here that would like to know if you have any stories about andre the giant oh my god andre the giant uh was was a big 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 man and I remember that I was with him in, in, in Hawaii one time and uh, we wrestled in Japan and uh, on the way back we stopped in Hawaii and uh, we got into a cab and uh, this Japanese driver was saying, no, 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 flat tire, flat tire. Because when Andre got in the front seat, he says, just drive. Uh, but Andre was, I mean, everybody knows that Andre, Andre liked his liquor and I mean, you'd see Andre pretty, pretty much. You'd think that he had way too much to drink, but you know, by the time uh, he got to the ring and he'd be laying, you'd think that he'd be passed out. And as soon as they said, Andre, you're, you're next, you know, he'd get up and like nothing happened. You know, he'd go in there and, and have a great match. Uh, I mean, he was, he was, to me, the best big worker in, in our business. You know, he, he had great ring psychology and uh, he could work with little guys and he could work with the big guys and, and he, he could carry a match. How was working with Andre the Giant? Andre was, you know, Andre was great. And of course, you know, you know, that was, you know, you know, you know we call it the rub in the, in the business. You know, like when you see a new guy and you see he's got potential, you know, you put him with somebody that's going to help elevate his status, you know, to the next notch. And, you know, uh, you know, Vince wanted to get the million dollar man character over in a big way. And he couldn't have gotten it over in any bigger way <laughs> than by putting me with Andre the Giant. And, uh, uh, you know, Andre didn't Andre didn't do a lot of fancy stuff, but Andre's understanding of the psychology of wrestling is. As, as 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 much as anybody's and uh you know he was he was fun i had a I had a great time with the guy you know he you know uh, of course you know when i was wrestling and we were tagging you know i was the guy that was in the in the ring taking all the bumps you know and, and taking the beating and he was the guy you know uh you know andre did you know you know he didn't have to ever sell too much i did all the selling <laughs> And Andre was known for always picking up the tab. Would he let you pick up the tab knowing that it was on Vince's bill? <laughs> no, 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 he, 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 and that's true about him. 
he would never let you pick up, the, you know, he just wouldn't, you know, you know, and I would try and I, and I, and I'd say, Andre, I said, but you know, Vince gave, gave me this money and, and said, spend it, you know? And he says, when you spend it, he just get the receipts and bring the receipts to me and I'm going to replenish it. And he says, no, no boss. When you drink with me, you know, you don't pay. So, but you do pay, you pay with a hangover the next day. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how you guys did it. <laughs> he couldn't. He couldn't fit in the uh, airplane bathrooms. But uh, Andre was the same way. But Andre used to take uh, when he went to Japan. He'd take laxatives and uh, clean himself out before he got on the plane. <laughs> God, it sounds like a medical uh, conference here. <laughs> Well, speaking of Andre, last night I interviewed uh, Ken Patera as my uh, mm. chauffeur comes back here. But um, Ken had a, some pretty funny stories about Andre the Giant and uh, going to the bathroom and stuff. But do you have any funny stories you could share w with us about the Giants? Because Ken was telling us he actually has a funny side to him that a lot of people don't know about. Yeah, yeah, Andre, uh, I met Andre in New Zealand just before I came here, and uh, he could barely speak English, and uh, I told him, I said, well, I'm, I'm going to the United States, and I'll, I'm going in March, so maybe I will see you there. Oh, yes, 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 but yes, you know, and um, then I think it was 19, late 1973, I walked into television in New York, well, in New York, in Philadelphia, that's where we done our TV, and Andre was there. Excuse me. And uh, he got up, came over, he said, hello, Tony, he remembered my name. I said, oh, Andre, how are you? Good. So I said, how long are you in for? He, you know, they were in for, I think, two or three weeks or something. I said, oh, who are you riding with? He said, oh, you, I don't know. He was there with his manager, Frank Valois. So I said, well, ride with me. I had a, a big LTD, you know, and um, and one trip we left from uh, New Haven, Connecticut and drove down to Philadelphia, down the show in Philadelphia. And then we, we crossed uh, the uh, Walt Whitman Bridge into New Jersey and I knew where I could buy beer. So I said, well, we got about 160 miles to go. So a case and a half will be good. So I uh, bought a case and a half of beer. We got to the end of the Jersey Turnpike and it was gone. So uh, before I got on the George Washington Bridge in Fort Lee, I knew where there was a bar there. So I pulled up there and I got another three six packs. I said, that should do it. You know, cause Andre's drinking most of it. And, um, and before we got to the Connecticut border, the 18 were gone between him and his manager. Yeah, Ken was saying that the manager weighed about 300 pounds and mm -hmm. could put back almost as much beer as most of the wrestlers, if not more. Yeah, yeah, Frank Valois. But uh, uh, Andre was, yeah, he had a good, he had a good sense of humor. And uh, we were the same age, so that's what I have in common with uh, Andre. I think he's four months older than me. He was four months older than me. How was he to work with in the ring and to work with as an agent? Oh, he was good. Yeah, he was excellent. Actually, um, I was down in the Carolinas and uh, I, was, I was driving him around. It was one of those holiday weekends which uh, were big in the Carolinas. And we had a show in the afternoon and the night show was... Uh, Greenville, North Carolina. So I drove him from uh, from the afternoon show, and then we went to Greenville, and he was working with um, Jimmy Snooker, and it's still one of the best all-round matches, never mind, you know, uh, a giant against a regular guy. It, it was just absolutely fantastic. You know, he could... He could work. I if you could share any stories about Andre the Giant. Andre, um, yeah, you know, what an incredible athlete, you know, larger than life uh, figure. Um, he worked quite a few times uh, for my dad. He would come in during the uh, 
stampede shows and uh you know always a great draw you know and what can you say about andre he was just a incredible performer you know who had great agility knew how to wrestle he wasn't just sort of a uh, a lumbering uh giant that got over because of his size you know he he had worked a lot in um in france and uh um europe and then uh then really learned how to wrestle in japan um you know long before he even came to uh north america you know but he he was a skilled athlete you know like for his his size he was uh incredibly gifted and uh could perform well in the ring and not a guy that you took uh liberties with but andre could be temperamental at times um you know you, you just never knew what you were dealing with uh he seemed to be more uh gentle and at ease with with females you know if, if especially if uh um you know you're at a a bar or a restaurant or a festive party or something you know andre was very uh very um uh very very much at ease you know in, in a party like atmosphere and he would he would buy uh rounds and rounds of, of drinks and champagne you know for everybody in that sense he was very generous but uh uh but other times you know he could, he could be very moody and standoffish you know i think he's very self-conscious about uh being someone that was unique and not being uh looked at as a, as a freak um you know or or uh uh someone that was different from others you know so um at times he wasn't very uh, approachable about uh making public appearances or signing autographs he could be very uh distant in that sense and uh, um you know, I, I remember one story, and it was just to me kind of a unfortunate thing. There was a, he was wrestling at one of the um, first WWF shows here, I think, in uh, 1984. I think uh, it was after Stampede had closed, and Andre had been uh, working in the main event, I think, against Kamala. And uh, you know, it was the end of the show, and I think he just wanted to get back to his hotel. Um, and um, there were, you know, some some fan had gotten his kid, his son all the way into the back area of the dressing rooms. I don't know how he got through security, but uh, he brought his uh, son, you know, into into the uh, waiting area there, you know, close to where the dressing rooms were. And uh, it asked me if I could get an autograph uh, of Andre the Giant for his son, you know, and uh, uh, I said, I don't know if I can or not, uh, you know, because I knew Andre uh, could be pretty standoffish and uh you know if he, if he was in a hurry just to get back to his hotel or get to the bar to join uh his friends you know um so but i remember uh approaching andre said uh, there's a fan here and uh, he wanted uh he wanted to know if you would sign his autograph for his son and andre just kind of nodded like no and walked right past the fan you know and the guy saw that too and i i just felt kind of embarrassed i thought you know what it wasn't like there was 50 people there and if you had to sign one autograph you'd have to sign them all it was just one one uh father there with his kid you know who had waited and stuck around to the end of the show after all uh the you know the fans had left and uh uh, you know, Andre had even just stopped and signed it. Well, it might have taken uh, 10 seconds of his time, but that's the way he was, you know. Um, you know, he, at times he could, he could be very uh, uh, sociable and, you know, if, if he had uh, some friends around him and, and he could be drinking beers or throwing wines back, you know, and he could drink so much, you know, it was incredible. He, he could drink uh, a dozen beers in 30 minutes on a road trip where, you know, uh, half an hour uh, into a plane taking off, you know, there's uh, Andre could just drink and drink. And uh, I think he could be very merry and sociable at times, but at other times, uh, you know, he, he could be uh, pretty uh, moody and standoffish and uh, um, not not the easiest guy to um, negotiate with, you know. So, you know, for my dad, it was hard to get Andre to uh, appear at some of our functions, you know, for the stampede, like the grandstand show or uh the parade you know he he really didn't want to be a part of that he just uh wanted time to himself but uh you know he didn't realize those those things you know were, were helping us draw fans to the show and uh you know get get some pr and uh media attention and uh andre uh, quite often would 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 limit his availability for those things so that was uh sometimes frustrating for my dad and i think a lot of promoters that dealt with him but um you know, an, an incredible athlete and uh, a great performer, no doubt. Someone uh, wants to know what Andre the Giant was like backstage and how did you react after finding out he passed away? Uh, Andre, uh, I mean, 
there's a giant uh, passed away, I believe it was 1993. It was the same year my father passed away. Uh, my dad was doing a diabetes that was blind, but had raised me. Uh, he wasn't my biological father, but you know, he, made what he was. He was everything to me. Didn't matter if he was my blood or not. He raised me, and he went through hell on earth. He's a master welder. Uh, he went blind. I stayed there with him. I had to. He, he had nobody, and me and him were just super close. And Andre done a remarkable thing for my dad. There's so much to stand, stay jack, and they're Oliver. Uh, when he was in Portland, he left on Saturday night. And uh, I believe he was here in a triple tag match with uh, Andre. Playboy Buddy Rose and myself against, I think, Rip Alder and the Clan. And uh, after after uh, the match, uh, my dad was there and got to meet Andre, and Andre really liked my dad. And uh, uh, I asked if he would like to go to dinner. He went with my dad and I, and I'll never forget that. Uh, I always got on good with Andre. And, he was always self-conscious of how big he was because everybody always stared at him. You can imagine that. Everybody constantly staring at you. But that was the experience I had with Andre. He, he was big, he was big, but his heart was big. You knew Andre the Giant pretty well. Did you see his recent HBO documentary? I, I just caught about the last 20 minutes of it and I was glued to it and I'm waiting to see I'm sure it's going to run again and, and want to see the whole the whole thing and I had the pleasure of uh, being around Andre he, when I was in different locations I used to drive a, one of those extended Dodge vans with the side doors and I had the whole interior customized with carpeting and they only had two captain's chairs in the front there was carpet all the way to the back and there was a chair in the back and Andre could get through the side doors and lay out completely on the floor and sleep. And he used to love to travel with me. And uh, he was uh, there only been one Andre. I did see a match with you and Kamala where where Andre came out at the end of it, and the crowd went absolutely nuts because I guess that was a more rare thing back then. Now, if if someone comes out during a match. You barely hear a peep, but I saw all the fans on their feet and everything. Yeah, uh, what was it like working with Andre? It was, you know, it, it, I'm I'm a little upset about that video on YouTube because they cut it off because at the end he actually walked me back to the dressing room, and you could just see how enormous the guy was. We we walked side by side back to the dressing room. Andre liked me. He thought I worked hard in the ring, and and I kept I I listened to my second dad Strongbow, and I kept my mouth shut. Um, you know, so I wasn't a guy that was constantly talking in the dressing room and everything. And Andre recognized that. So, um, you know, I, I, I abided by the rules of the business. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I got a buddy Lou, <laughs> he knows nothing about the wrestling business. So he texts me, I found this hilarious. I don't know if anybody else will. But he goes, hey, Mark. I go, yeah. He goes, you know, I watched this match with Kamala and Andre came out. I go, yeah. He goes, and then I watched this match with Bad News Brown and Andre came out again, shook your hand. Because before my match with Bad News Brown, Andre had been away making the Princess Bride. So that was his first appearance back to the WWF after he was done with the movie. So before I worked with Bad News Brown, they brought him out. And he came in, shook the referee's hand, my hand, and then, of course, Bad News wouldn't shake his hand. He's a heel, so he wouldn't shake his hand. And Andre left, so my buddy Lou goes, this guy comes out twice, two different matches, and he doesn't help you. What's up with that? <laughs> I don't know, Lou. He just He goes, he literally just left you there. One time he watched you get beat up and the other time he just came in and shook your hand and let you he, he won't help you he, he couldn't help you <laughs> he started laughing. i go no louis he, he didn't help me i'm sorry <laughs> but 
but Andre, um, Andre didn't have a middle road. Andre saw black and white. So, um, if he liked you, you were fine. If he didn't, you were screwed. So I'm very, he, he, you, you'd never hear Andre say he's okay. Mm -mm. No, he either liked you or he didn't. So I was fortunate. Uh, I'll admit I stayed away from him in battle Royals. I, I, I don't, I don't know. I just didn't want to get hit by Andre. <laughs> Every time I get close to him in a battle Royal, I went the other way. <laughs> I go the other way. So I didn't know I wasn't, I wouldn't, I, I didn't work with him in battle Royals, which would be the only, the only opportunity I would have had to um, to work with them. Those Andre matches, that's really, really cool. What was it like working with Andre the Giant? Andre the Giant was a uh, uh, true professional. True professional, you know. Uh, you get in the ring and, and, you tr and you trusted the guy. You had to trust him. You know <laughs> what you mean? Uh, when, when somebody as big as he is, as tall as he is, uh, and you, and you do what he asks you to do too <laughs> in the ring. Uh, but, but there really wasn't too much talk between me and him. He would do his thing and, and I would do mine to get some heat and so forth. He'd make his comeback and, and we go home and, and that's pretty much it. You know, I never, I never worked with him in, in, in a house show of any kind. So you mentioned Andre, what was Andre really like? I mean, is he really this big drinker, this big guy, you know yes, what I mean? Yes. All these stories, is this actually true? Yep. And now uh, Andre, I got photos here, but, um, they're on the phone that I'm using with you now. Otherwise, I'd show you Andre in New Zealand's 350 at 744. Now, the last show that he did was WWE. He was, you know, he had knee surgery. And he was in Butch and Mice Corner, the Bushwagon's Corner, against the natural disasters. He was 540 pounds. So he gained, he gained uh, 200 pounds, you know. In the, from um, 69 to uh, 80, 80, uh, 92. 92, that last match was when we were against the natural disasters. If you look up on, on Google and that, you'll see an interview with us doing it for the show, the natural disasters, a promo with Andre with us. Yeah, he's got the canes on his hand, right? The Yeah, yeah, yeah he was. Oh, now, mate. I travel with this bar. I travel with this big bastard. I love the guy to death. He, you know, if he liked you, he'd look after you. And he looked after me and Butch when we arrived in Montreal. And that, and um, of course, when then after Montreal, we were doing the territories around the States. You know, we went for Stu, and then we came in the States. Now, I've got to tell you how go, going to Stu, but we worked around the state, so we met him. You know, he's, he was brought into a lot of territories for a week, you know, you know, in the summertime, and, or, you know, brought into territories for a few shows, and that we worked with him in a lot of areas, a lot of t territories. And then, then of course, WW, WWF. But uh, one night we were with him, and we were way out the north of Canada, and, um, we were working against him and I think uh, Dominic Danucci, God bless him. He just died last year. You remember Dominic Danucci? Oh, yeah. Actually, oddly enough, I interviewed him about a month before he passed. He sounded as healthy as could be. So I was shocked when he passed. Yes, I was with him too. And that um, him and, uh, of course, Dominic Danucci and, and Tony Paglacy, they were the big tag teams for Vince. And up in Canada too, the Italian connection. Anyhow, I, I worked with Dominic and, and, and uh, Andre up north for a week, and we're driving back. And of course, he had Frank Vauer, his manager, with him driving the car. And he was, and he he, he was driving, or Frank was. Anyhow, they bought seventy-two beers. I'd say two and a half hours later, we had to stop at a truck stop to get another seventy-two. <laughs> wow. So he is a big drinker. Uh, no, no, elite. You know, a can of beer would be two or three gulps. You know what I mean? Yeah. That I was can a can. And that big hand would just go like that. That big hand would just go like uh, like that. And the can would be crushed. Bang. You know, your monstrous hands. Would and he get it, drunk? It, no. Would he get drunk though or no? No. 
No, he 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 get he get merry, joke and all that sort of stuff. But he always walked. He never walked walked straight. He was, I never saw that big bugger get drunk. You know, he, he joke and ha ha and all that sort of stuff and have a good time. But I never saw him. And he used to. Fitz was the only guy that let him drink in the in the end. You know, in the in the nineties and the late eighties, and that Vince would let him drink in the dressing room. He was going through a lot of pain at the time. You know, that giantitis, he never got shot up, you know. It was too late for him, I think, when they came out with all those drugs that would, that would um, control the giantitis, or whatever you yeah, call it. Yeah, to you know? control the gland, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and, um, and uh, he was in a lot of pain because the, between the joints, the cartilage, with that... With that um, that hormone it goes it grows the cartilage between the joints and it pushes the joints apart and that's where the pain is. You know, the cartilage yep. starts growing. So there's too much testosterone in their system. Yeah, for sure. Do you think he was drinking because he was in all that pain or was he drinking yeah, for, yeah, for yeah. you know for I fun think, too? No, in, the, in the end he'd have be, before the show he'd drink two bottles of red wine before a match. Yeah, that was to ease, to ease the pain and get his mind away from the pain. Of course, you know, that pain, you know, it's the same as people, the bodybuilders that take HGH, you see their forehead come out. Arnold, for one, you know, Arnold, the bodybuilder. Oh, yeah. And there's yep. a lot of them. You look at them and they, you know, the jaw comes out and that that's because the cartilage is in their head and forces those bone structures apart. And he, yeah, he yep. was he was drinking, but he was a lot of fun. He'd, we'd meet him later for meals. He had special places in Montreal where he used to go and eat. I, I forget the street, but he he had a place upstairs on the corner of this off the main street off off um, Saint Catherine's. There's the main street in Montreal downtown. Down one end is east and west. Now one end, the east end is. Very French. That's where Butch and me were living. They didn't, if you walked in a store, they talked French to you. They didn't want to talk English, even though they knew English. But, uh, we were there then, yeah, and with, with Andre. But he took care of Butch and me. The very infamous yeah. angle where yourself and uh, John Studd cut the hair of Andre the Giant and what that was like, given his uh, reputation for being somewhat ornery if he didn't like you. I was real good friends with uh, Andre. Andre, uh, we went out to eat all the time. Uh, when we were in Japan together, he he wouldn't let me buy a meal. And we were out every night. You know, oh, yeah, I, I was good friends with Andre. And in the beginning, he liked John Studd. But then John started acting like a fucking giant. You know, he got on that growth hormone and grew three and a half inches. That's when he was in his mid-30s. I, I didn't know anybody could grow in their mid-30s, you know, maybe in their early 20s. He took so much growth hormone. Well, he killed himself. And I told him, I said, you stay on that growth hormone and all those steroids You've been on for the past five or six years. You're going to wind up dead. And uh, he did wind up dead. And it's a great story in your book, and it's kind of an infamous story with you, is uh, Andre the Giant was a bit racist towards you, and apparently you pulled a gun on him, and after that he basically had respect for you. What is the truth behind that story? Okay, now, yeah, I didn't pull the gun, but I had the gun on and, and matter of fact, I'm looking at the gun right now, 357 Magnum. But here's the thing. The first time I ever wrestled under the Giant was in Oklahoma City in 1982 for Mid-South Sport. So I had never wrestled him before. And Andre, in the ring, it was a spot. See, they, they were spinning the finishes and the spots back and forth by the referee. And I might have did get a spot mixed up. 
and Andre threw me up often, and he called me a dumb SOB. And he jumped up when he come up. That's when I beat the hell out of him. Right there in the rain. And I mean, that was for real. And after that next night, we were wrestling each other in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So anyway, I had this 357 Magnum. I put it in my pocket. And I went over there to Andre the Giant in his dressing room. I stuck my finger on his nose, and he threw up both hands. And now he didn't see a gun; he just threw up his hand to I sorry with that big smile on his face. I sorry, boss. I I I sorry. I I didn't mean to uh, say that or do that. I sorry. And uh, I can't say what I want to say that I told him you know, on the radio like this. But after that, Andre and I had good matches everywhere we went, and we went all over. I never had another problem out of Andre. You basically, uh, you know, you made him respect you, and after that... Um... Obviously, uh, he's going to be very nice to you, especially with that 357. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, see, he didn't see the gun because I had it in my right pocket, but I had my hand on it because, you know, uh, Andre, as many times as I was harassing him, uh, he's, a, he's a scary big old son of a gun. He, and he's scary looking, and he's powerful, too. So I wasn't taking no chance on him jumping out of the trap, chill like a bear, and, and you know it hurt me. Now, I was gonna shoot him right there on the spot. So uh, anyway, cause Andre, I know he's strong because uh, uh, when you lock up with him, it just lock, like locking up with a bear, a wild animal. So because I wrestled a bear before, and I know his strength. So anyway, that's my story. I love Montreal, although I didn't go there very often, but I did wrestle Andre the Giant there at the Forum. We had almost 20,000 people slammed into that place. And I'll tell you a funny story. <clears throat> Andre and I were wrestling, you know, doing all kinds of stuff. All of a sudden, he says, slam me, slam me. I said, are you sure? Yeah. I picked him up, gave him a body slam right in the middle of the ring. You could hear a pin drop. Complete silence. I said, oh, fuck. We're going to have a riot here? <laughs> the, the riot didn't start for another 10 minutes. But uh, he was... Um, uh, uh, near the rope, yeah, it, he rolled over a couple times, so he'd get near the rope. I covered him. He pushed me off. I took a bump through the rope onto the floor. And uh, I get back in, and about three, four, five minutes later, I said, slam me, slam me. So he picks me up, body slams me, you know, right, right, right next to the rope. And he covers me. Referee goes, one, two, I kicked out. And that big bastard went through the middle rope all the way to the floor. Wow. And, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, we just tore that place down. I mean, we tore it down. Like like I say, after the match, we had a fucking riot. And, yeah, they, they said if... Uh... If Andre liked you, he'd really uh, go that extra mile to, to make you look like a million dollars. We were good friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Andre and I were real close. I remember when Andre the Giant got me, it wasn't a prank, it was a real elbow. Um, we were doing an interview at the Spectrum. Uh, what happened, John, back in the day was they would do shows once a month at the Spectrum, Madison Square Garden, and the Boston Garden. And they would televise those locally only. 
Yeah, so MSG, right. Prism, and Nesson. Yep. There it was. Very good, John. You're good. You got well, you got a Villanova yeah. shirt on. Is that right? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> Looks like the Villanova V. Yeah, so no, it I'm, is. Yeah, my uh, my wife's yes. uh cousin went there. Yep. Went there, Villanova. Okay, so I would do the color on a lot of these, not the garden shows, the ones in Boston and the ones in I would do play by play or color depending on who was there. Um because usually the guy that did the play-by-play -play was a local guy, like at Prism, it was this guy, Dick Graham. I mean, fans, don't you love it? Don't you really love it? Oh, he was an FM DJ. Didn't know anything about what was going on in wrestling. Uh, but, he, <laughs> but he was a regular on Prism. He would do the, the matches. So I would do the color to provide the, the storylines, what's going on, here's what's coming up, well, that's what, and do all that. Uh, I didn't break down the moves, per se, but I gave the – the, I gave the WWF a voice of what was going on currently, and he was the play-by-play -play guy. And I would do the interviews after all the matches there in Prism. So I did one with Andre once just to the left of the ring, and Andre had a way of pausing. And I'm holding the mic up, and I'm waiting. I thought he was done. And he wasn't done, actually. I had my right arm, I remember. Because he, he put my right arm down like that, and then he said, I'm not finished talking yet. Grab the mic back, and boom. Elbow right to the gut. You ever gotten an elbow from Andre the Giant? <laughs> no, never. <laughs> yeah, I was like, Ugh. but it, you know, it was one of those. I actually lost my breath for a second, but it made for good TV. But it wasn't planned. I can tell you that. Was he legitimately pissed, or just messing with you? Uh, you know, like we said earlier, John, everybody's on, and if if the TV hot shot here wants to take the mic away from Andre the Giant, he's going to pay the price uh, because that's what, you know, that's what Andre the Giant would do. Yep. Uh, so, you know, it was, it, it, look, it's, just, it's, it's, there's acting, there's storylines, there's characters. And I think it was in the nature of who Andre the Giant was that he would not just be politely say, Mr. Craig to George, I'm not, you know, that was, you know, that's what he would do. No, it was just a reaction. You know, I can remember Dosey doing with, you know, and I'm not much of a dancer with Hillbilly Jim uh, on, on live and, you know, like, or, you know, Ron Bass with that Miss Betsy, you know, you had to get out of the way, uh, jumping off stages, you know, in interviews when things were going haywire. I don't know who had the last tango in Tampa. This was in like 19... In Florida, yeah, CWF. Betty Graham. Betty Graham, okay, so anyway, I was probably 18 maybe 19 but i think it's more like 18. there was a knock on the dressing room door and i answered the door and there stood andre the giant with a platter of sandwiches and that's all whoa wow <laughs> he had no clothes on uh so I accepted the sandwiches and thanked him <laughs> and closed the door i don't know what to say you know? <laughs> because if he like you you he won't let nobody mess with you yeah Another time, he used to get in people's cars, and every time he leaned in, leaned back to get his seats in, he would break his seats. So the wrestlers, they wouldn't let Andre ride with him no more. So they told Andre he had to get his own car. Andre would have bought a Lincoln Town car with a sunroof. So he could stick his and head he got, he, got these, he, he got these goggers, these big goggers, and put on his face. And when he drove his car, he stick his head through the roof of the car. So he going down the road one day, him had stolen, and some guy saw it, and he thought it was a mannequin. You know, this car, because Andre had a huge head, so it didn't look like no human head. <laughs> so when the guy got up the side of Andre, he's looking at, looking at his head sticking out the roof of the car. So Andre turned to look at the guy. The guy got scared, let go of the steering wheel, and hit the side of Andre's brand new car. Andre chased him down. The guy locked the door. Andre grabbed the car and flipped the car over with the guy in it. Wow. Yeah. Another time I was in Norfolk, Virginia, and Black Jack Mulligan, I know Black Jack was one of them, Angela Mosca, I believe, was one of them. So about four big guys, they're going to throw Andre in the water. Andre didn't want to go in the water. So they're going to throw him in the water. Man, shoot. Andre threw, threw them guys around. You know, Blackjack was a big guy. Yeah, and he was known for being really tough, too, apparently, from what I heard. Well, not with Andre, he won. Andre just threw him like he was a, a rag doll. 
like a rag doll. And another thing people didn't realize about Andre too, he's if he didn't like certain wrestlers, he would check the all. Really? Now what that means, what he would do, that he had big fingers. I mean huge fingers. Andre would get you down on your stomach and he would take his thumb and as hard as he could, he would hit you in the rectum with it. I couldn't and even imagine that, how painful that would be. Boy, I, I, I saw him do that to a guy one time. I said, I'm glad he likes me. But I said, I'm so glad he likes me. And I saw Andre in Japan chase Hogan out of the villain. Don Morocco was watching the match with Don Morocco. And Morocco said, well, I guess Hogan reign over here in Japan is over. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said, he said, Hogan, he said, Hogan is not the man over here in Japan. And Andre chased him out of the building. He sent people back to the building, get it forward. He was scared to come back to the building. Yeah, because didn't he bully uh, Hogan for a while in quite a few of their matches uh, back when Hogan was a heel? No, it was just something about them. They did just, it was something. No, I, nobody really know what the true story that happened between them or something, but. Something it was something that 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 that, that was about Hova that uh, Andre just didn't like. And I don't know what it was. You know, I, I never tried to get that much into the business because when Andre, I try to stay out of Andre business. I just hung around him a lot because he liked me. You know, um, when, I, when he was around, I never had to pay for my meal. I come and sit there, boss. You come sit with me. He, I think he liked me because me here was what we call the oddballs. I was the only black guy, and people used to make fun of me because I was black. And Andre was on a jank. And with me, I always tell Andre I got bigger arms than him. Yeah. I said, Andre, don't you wish your arms were as big as man? He liked that. Right, because you did The only thing bit. Andre, yeah, well, he didn't like people to talk about his size. He didn't like yeah. that. A lot of people, because it made him feel like the man, odd man out. He wanted to feel like one of the guys, you know? Yeah. So if you made Andre feel like one of the guys, but if you walk up to damn, look how big your hands are. Oh, wow, you so big. He would get away from it because now you, you're outcasting him to him. What's the most you he ever witnessed him? Yeah, you always, yeah, you always want to be a normal guy. If, if, if you treat him like a normal guy and just, and, and you know, the same thing with the bitches. They were the same way. I mean, if you started talking about how short they were, they didn't like that. Okay. Right, so it was just the opposite with Andre. You're like a short person. Don't want you telling them every day how, how short they are. They know they're short. Or a fat person, don't want you telling them that they're fat. That's true. They yeah. know they're fat. Yeah. Well, giants are the same way. Because he always, people always looked at him like he was, a, you know, uh, in a zoo or something. So he always, made, he always feel like he didn't fit in. So when you made him fit in and just treat him like a normal person, he would treat you like gold. He felt like he could hang around you. He just want to be. He just want to be normal. And I gotta ask fact, you before he be, before he passed away. I remember he was telling all the stolen. Stolen passed now, so there's nobody to back up my word. But because the people that was there, they all gone. Now SD is gone. Stolen is gone. I don't know if Renee Goulet is still alive, but he was one of the people who'd be around Andre a lot of friendship. He was so afraid. That when he died, they, they didn't want to experiment on his body. So that's why he wanted to be cremated as soon as he died. That was his wish to be cremated. He didn't want to be buried. But he figured they were going to dig him up and, 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 and put him in a laboratory. Wow, that's very interesting. Because Andre was not like Big Show. See, Big Show is like a big man. Yeah. The great Colleen is like a big man. Andre was not like a, no, I'm not trying to bad mouth. No, he was not like a, a man. He has 60-some teeth in his mouth. But if you really look at it, he had very, very small teeth. Yeah, it's almost he like a dinosaur. Teeth. Yes. Yes. So they say that Andre was that missing link between, you know, being a Neanderthal. Because if you look at his build, he was built like a giant dwarf. That's true. He had the same build as a midget. He was like a giant dwarf. If you look at the way he's built, he had his long uh, a torso, short leg, short arms, and a big head. If you take a picture of Andre and get a picture of Laurel Lillibrook and put them right beside each other, 
They got the exact same bill. Andre Hans came to his waist. If you look at yourself, the average person's elbow come to their waist. That's true. Just look at Pitcher Andre and then think of a draw. Yeah. He looked just like Lil Louis. He looked built like Lil Louis. Him and Hawk Swallow got he got to have the same as he can Hawk Swallow. Now that you mention it, that's a very good point. Yeah, nobody noticed that, but the Santas did. And you got to feud with Hogan when you got there. I mean, you got some WWF yeah. championship matches. Uh, one in New York was a big one, then a huge one in Philly, which was on the Prism Network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I wrestled Hulk a lot you know, all over the country. Jesus. I I don't even know how. I, I, I run, All together, I probably wrestled Hulk 200 times. I'll tell you who I wrestled the most. I thought that I had wrestled Andre around 400 times. He said, no, boss, 600 times. Oh, my God. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, all the battle royals all over the country, that was like 150. Yep. And we were always the last two in the ring. I said, yeah, no, you're right. And then all the tag teams. The six-man tag teams, the eight-man tag teams, the individual matches. We had like 250 uh, individual matches. And I'm, I said, your favorite subject in school was math, right? Yes. I said, that's why you remember all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I used to re- Favorite guy in the world to play cribbage with was Andre. I love playing cribbage with him. He went about 60% of the time. I mean, we played all the time. And uh, he was a hell of a card player. Uh, and uh, uh, rummy, he loved playing rummy. But cribbage was his favorite. And cribbage was my favorite, too. And uh, after about a year, I said, Andre, give me some tips. What do you mean? Give me some tips on cribbage so I can beat you more often, so we can level the playing field here. You beat me uh, six out of 10 times. That's 60%. I only win 40%. We have to make it 50 <laughs> 50. He started right. laughing. He started laughing his ass off. Oh, yeah. He must have liked you though, because he let you shave his head. I mean, not let you, but you know, storyline wise, oh, shaved your head. Yeah, he, he must have liked you a little bit. Oh, we were good friends. Oh yeah, very yeah, very good. We used to go out all the time, and uh, we used to uh, have dinner. At, oh shit, all all over the country, wherever we were, especially in Japan when we were over to Japan together. Uh, this one place, uh, uh, Rudy's. Rudy was a like a six foot three, three hundred pound German. Uh, maybe Rudy weighed three fifty, and he was older. He was about fifty five, maybe sixty at the time. But he had an unbelievable German restaurant, and it was downstairs in the basement of this big shopping mall over in Tokyo. So. Uh, uh, Andre took me and Dick Murdoch. Oh, a couple other guys. There were five or six of us. He says, Kenny, you know, the waitress come around. And uh, Kenny, you order the ham hocks. The ham hocks are that big. They're unbelievable. And I said, okay. I, I said, Andre, why don't you just order ham hocks for everybody? Yeah, which he did. So Rudy comes over with a platter, a big fucking platter, all full of uh, different liqueurs, uh, Ruppelmans, uh, Jägermeister, Goldschlager, and then the girls would come behind him with these big steins of beer, you know, like 25 ounce, uh, I don't know how many. And Rudy... The owner of the place, he sat down and drank with us. 
And God, he was a good guy. And uh, he, he spoke English real well. And he speak uh, Japanese fluently. Of course, he lived in uh, Tokyo. And uh, that was one of the most fun dinners I ever had. Uh, drink, uh, uh, Rufflemans, a Jägermeister, Goldschlager, pounding the beard. Um, we went to Dayton Hair Arena when I was probably 12 years old. And Andre the Giant was a special guest there. And I didn't know, I, I didn't dream that 15 years later, me and my brother would be in the same wrestling ring in, in Japan for all Japan wrestling against Andre the Giant. I never would have thought that, but that came true. I, I ended up wrestling Andre three times. Wow, I didn't realize that. That's amazing. Was he moving around much at this point or not much? No, sir. No, it, it was uh, it was late 92. I believe he passed in January 93. Yeah. Um, it was six mans. They, they would put him with two young Japanese boys. And uh, it was me, my brother, and the Patriot one time. Me, uh, the Patriot, and Joel Deaton another time. And I can't, re I can't remember the third one. Probably me, the Patriot, and Joel Deaton again. But uh, no, no, sir. He he wasn't moving around that that well. We uh, we worked around him. We you know he stood in the middle and we bumped our behinds off. And uh, he he got in a little bit and did his few things and then got out. So he's not taking any bumps, obviously, at this well, point. He, he did not leave his feet, no, sir. Actually, oh. that one the one time he beat me. Toward the end, he went and sat on your chest like he used to do because he was older and he couldn't stand up, you know. So what he did with me is uh, he just put his boot on my chest. One, two, three. It was still an honor, though. Yeah. yeah. To me, it's still so crazy that he literally was wrestling like six months before he passed away because it's like, wow, I can't even believe he was out there to begin with because in WWF in 91, remember, he was walking with crutches and stuff, those, those arm crutches. It's crazy yeah. to think that he was wrestling in Japan in late 92. Yeah, yeah, and and I'd have to check it, but I think it was January. I remember coming home from a tour, and I worked an independent show around North Carolina, and on the way home, I heard it on the radio. The, the legend Andre the Giant has passed. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Andre, the mighty and now, and Ogawa defeats Bobby Fulton, Jackie Fulton, and the Patriots. So you and your brother got the team against them. That, cool. All right. Yeah. yeah. That's and awesome. That was, yeah, that was before I was wearing a mask. I think I think I worked him once as Jackie Fulton and twice as the Eagle. Because uh, the tag team tournament was no, November into December. And that's that's the first time I was the Eagle, and uh, me and the Patriot were teamed up. So yeah, that was the first time I was the Eagle. So so we we probably worked them twice uh, on that tour. Like on as a as a fan, like in the United States, so it was like ah, Andre, he was done in ninety. You know, after WrestleMania six, he left. No, he's still wrestling for two more years. That's just amazing to think. It's awesome to to get in the ring with him, even though he couldn't barely move. I mean, one of the biggest legends ever in the history of the business. Oh, well, he he was the biggest in my opinion. Um, yeah, a lot of times when nowadays when someone he, finds out somehow that I used to wrestle, they go, well, who's the biggest name you wrestled? And I say, Andre the Giant. And I don't think they believe me, but I don't care. I know the truth. Yeah. But that's awesome, though, that basically, you know, his last run, you get to wrestle and lose to him, which is an honor, too. You get to, you know, take the pin from him. It was a complete honor. Yeah. And, and the, mag the magazine even had a picture of him standing on my chest getting a one, two, three. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Very cool. Man, it's just crazy to think that he's still going then, you know, 92. Wow. Yeah, bless his heart. And, you know, he lived in he lived in just outside of Rockingham, North Carolina. Big farm, right? Yeah. And I actually, I actually, he worked an independent show or two around here. Uh, I know North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, a guy by the name of Carl Brantley. Who ended up, who wrestled as Vladimir Koloff. Ivan, Ivan Koloff took him on as another uh, nephew, Vladimir, he ran a show and he got to be friends with Andre because uh, Carl's family owned a uh, farm too, a uh, ranch. So uh, Andre was at his show one time. And uh, so, yeah, he was still working independence and still going to Japan some. We were traveling. We were traveling uh, from Port, well, he had had a, 
the promoter back then, I won't say your name, had a problem with his car because he went to pick up Andrew at the airport and Andrew was so big that he broke his front seat. He was upset. So Andre was in the dressing room and in Portland, and I was there at that time in the Portland, Oregon territory. And I uh, at that I happened to uh, to be there that that wrestling time. That uh, promoter was upset, and uh, I offered to volunteer because I had a 1973 ragtop Lincoln Continental two door, and it and when I put that back seat back and down, it was I couldn't even reach the pedals. So I told uh, I told the promoter at that time. I said, hey, you know, I I'd like to uh, if you want me to. I'm in the I'm in the same shows he is for the next two weeks here, and we were in the same shows. I was in earlier matches. You know what I mean? Like preliminaries, he was in the main events. So I said I didn't mind taking him, and uh, he turned around and he was sitting down and he looked at me and he says, "You do that for me, boss." I said, "Yes, sir, I, I would." And so we became very good friends. So we were, we were traveling from uh, Portland to Pendleton. So it was about, oh, I'd say be three, four hour drive. So I'm driving and I'm like, he's talking to me and I'm laughing and he's, he's laughing. And I had, the way I could do it, I had to see it all the way back down. He was drinking beer because he drank beer. I seen him drink 48 beers on the way to the matches. So he drank all the way there. I'm talking 48 beers. He won't. Like a little bunch, throw it away. And so Andre, Andre, uh, we I got stopped by the cops because I'm going, I'm going faster than I should, because he's making me laugh. I'm talking and I'm laughing. Finally, I get off. I get off the the, the, the thing, and the cops giving me the ticket, and I'm looking at him. And I'm like, I didn't say anything because I wouldn't want to say nothing. <laughs> And he was drinking beer in the thing. So Andrew gets out of the car. And the car was down, right? Because he's he's heavy. He gets out of the car and the car goes up. And the door opens and he's out, right? And then he comes and this this cop is giving me the ticket like this, right? He's writing it like that. And he goes and he looks at Dinder and he goes. And his eyes went up. And I was looking at him and I wanted to laugh because it just went, it was so funny. And he was like, He's almost like mesmerized, right? And then Andrew says, you're going to give him that ticket? And he says, he didn't even say anything. <laughs> so he looked at me and says, he says, here, finish it. So he finished it. And then he then Andrew grabbed it and he goes, <laughs> put it in his, in his pocket. And he says, don't worry about it, boss. He says, um, the Portland uh, police chief is my friend. And he walked away. I never saw the, I never saw the ticket. I never paid it. I never paid it because it, it never went on my record, so it got so it got taken care of. Wow, yeah, that doesn't happen too much anymore. But in the old days, there were some benefits to being a wrestler. Oh yeah, but there's a secret to not being a shooter. I wasn't a shooter. In other words, I wasn't a great amateur wrestler and fighter before I started in the wrestling business. So there's a lot of tough guys in the business, but. The toughest guys in the wrestling business are my closest friends. So I would, if anybody started kind of getting a little irritated with me, I say, hey, listen, no offense, I'm not tough, but my best friend, if you mess with me, might, might not like that. Yes. <laughs> so I kept, I mean, you know, Andre was my closest buddy when I first started because I was like a little kid around him. But if you messed with me, Andre would get mad at him. And when I was young, a lot of guys messed with me. But Andre straightened out a few in my life. Later on, it was Haku. Any resentment from any of the guys, given that you're kind of a quote-unquote Crockett guy or an NWA guy, and you're coming in there and you get a pretty prominent role in a pretty prominent position, any resentment from the guys? Not that I was aware, but there was one little situation and <laughs> I had been very close to Andre the Giant uh, when he was uh, when I was in Amarillo when I was in other territories and, and he was he was barnstorming where he would come in to a, depending on the size of the territory anywhere from a week to, to three weeks and invariably I would have him over to my home to cook a home cooked meal for him and I. You know, I thought that I had, you know, a really a, a, a good relationship with him. 
And Vince was always up front. There was no like things going on behind and things said about, he was very upfront, which I, I have great respect for him for that. But he told me that, uh, it shocked a lot of people when I was hired to, to go to New York and Andre was there at the time. And because my, my background had been so closely associated with the national wrestling Alliance territories, uh, Vince told me one day, he said, Andre came to him. And again, Andre would go to other territories, but like Vince is the one that booked him out. And he said, Andre came to him. And he said, I just want you to know, because we don't have any secrets around here. He said, Andre said, you know, you sure that you're, you know, you're good, good with hiring this guy? Because he's, he's, he's been so strongly associated with the, with the, with the NWA. You have any reservations at all? And Vince said, no. I, I'm very comfortable with hiring him and uh, my, whatever I contact I've had with him so far, he's everything that I heard about him and, and I'm, I'm glad that we were, we were able to get him. Vince then, <coughs> excuse me, made it a point to share that conversation with me about Andre. And he said, I just want you to know that Andre came to me and said, Hey, you know, he's, He's uh, he's one of those NWA guys. Are you sure that that you know that you want him here? And and you know we laughed about it. And uh, I don't know if Andre ever even knew that that Vince shared that with me. But that's how Vince was. He 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 didn't want behind the scenes maneuvering secrets that kind of thing. You know, and we just laughed about it. And it it, it didn't affect my relationship with Andre because um, I, I understood why Andre Andre said it because basically I had worked my whole career uh, in the South and with uh, the NWA and now I'm, I'm, I'm in a different territory and even though I was born and raised in New Jersey I was from really originally from that area um, but that's how Vince was he was very very open about everything and no secrets and I never had a discussion with Andre and Vince told Andre and this is what Vince told me. He said, no, I, you know, I know about his background and, you know, and I'm, I've looked him over and I have met him and very comfortable and he's everything that I've heard about him and I want him for my, uh, for his attention to detail. And he's, he's going to be an asset to my, to my company. Have you ever met Andre the giant and do you have any Andre stories? So I did meet Andre whenever I must have been, I think I was four or I, I don't know. I was a young kid, very young. So kindergarten age, I'd say five probably. And I have a picture actually of Andre's hand and my hand and Andre's hand as a little girl, but that's, that's the only lasting photo, you know, I have of him, but I remember you know, my grandfather was seven one, so it's not as if I hadn't seen super large people before. I mean, at some points, you know, Grizz weighed, you know, over 400, 450 pounds. So just like Andre, he was enormous. I came up to his elbow. So I have more memories, I guess, of his uh, presence because of him being around more than I do Andre, but Andre was very kind and very gentle is all I remember about him. Did, did Jake ever speak to you about the difficulty uh, working with Andre can, at that stage with the snake and, and uh, those famous matches uh, given Andre's uh, condition at the time? He, he really didn't. He just did speak honestly that Andre was truly scared of snakes and that that felt a bit um, sadistic in some ways to him to torture him on that level whenever he wasn't well. Uh, but that's all he's really mentioned. 
He was such a great man, you know, and um, a good a good man. I, I had no problems with him. We had a little problem uh, the first time we wrestled. He completely guzzled me. I mean, he ate my ass up, did not give me anything, and I went back to the locker room and had lost my mind and screamed at him. <laughs> uh, basically, the screaming was about, look, if, if you're going to work like that, brother, we're fucked. We're not going to make a goddamn nickel with this idea. And... Uh, Sometimes he tested people, and that's what it was with me. He wanted to test me and see if I'd speak up. And uh, when I spoke up, he looked at me and smiled and said, Come boss, and now, we have money. now we make money. You know, and, uh, he did that with several people. I mean, Savage for one. He, Savage was totally terrified of Andre, because if you didn't fight Andre when you're in the ring, I mean fight him, he would punish your ass. And Randy was light on him. And... Um, when you're light on him, he would toss you around the ring like a rag doll, man. It was pretty scary. Andre and me, we used to go out late at night a lot and get food after it was over. The only thing that was, after the, mat, the mat matches and everything were over, the only thing that was open in Tokyo, really it was easy and accessible to get to, was the Korean barbecue. So we would go there and drink the sake and cook our own food, and it was great food. So we were calling the cab, we need to get back. And uh, all these cabs would not stop because here's Andre. Oh, no, you can't get in there. So they, they kept running off. So Andre, I says, Andre, why don't you hide over by there and I'll, I'll flag a cab down and then you can come out and we can get in and get, get out of there. And so he came around, this one guy, and he came around and the guy goes, no, 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 no. He sees Andre. He says, no, 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 you can't get in my car. And he, and he gets in and starts to drive off. And Andre goes over and grabs the bumpers of cars and lifts him up. And the wheels are spinning like this. And the cab driver gets out, takes off running. And me and Andre just stand there laughing and laughing. Finally, they got, it. They got us one of the, the big taxis so we could get back to the... I remember Andre... On the, on the bullet train. He was way in the back and he's up against the wall and I'm way in the front and a whole row of Japanese people in between. No wrestlers, they were in the other car or something. He, he'd raise up in the back and he'd go boom, big old giant, giant fart, literally a giant fart. And the Japanese people all turned around and looked in unison at the same time. I go, hey, okay. then he'd do another one. Those are some funny stories. And uh, we did a big show in uh, Miami on Christmas Day. Depressing, you know, because it's beautiful, hot, and, you know, I don't want to see that. I'm a country boy. I want to see a little snow, you know. But I had to do the show. We did the show, and the next day we had to, be, we had to go to uh, Dayton, Ohio. We we're going to Dayton to, to the Hair Arena. So, we get up to the airport early that morning. Andre says, hey, boss, you sat by me. And I go, oh, shit. You know, I got the big hair at the time. I was about 45, 50 pounds every than I am now. You know, 300 some odd pounds or whatever it was. It was 60, 315 pounds, whatever. And I get in next to him. And here he gets here. And he's 500 some, 60 some pounds. Here we are, standing there. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at him be. He says, let's have a drink, boss. So, okay. Now, you got to understand this. Cut through it, go through it, finish it up. They started bringing all these little bottles. Vodka guy, but he we, we, he bring all these little bottles out. Everything. From the time they allowed us to begin the beverage service to the time they cut us off, we had drank 56 bottles of liquor. <laughs> I drank eight. He did the rest of them. Just on a flight from Miami, on the U.S. Air Flight that time, from yeah. Miami to uh, today. Before wrestling. <laughs> in the day, yeah. in the morning, it was morning time. Yeah. But he, that's what he did. And I drank Abe, and I was like, goober fail. Look at my red drink, I don't really care about it. And he did all that. I mean, he went, we went through everything, on, and, and the girl said, uh, the airline girl says, you all have drank all the bottles. <laughs> all the bottles. I mean, everything. He, 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 the, you know, the lighter ones first, then he went to the darker ones, rums and the things, whiskeys and whatnot, and he got all the wine. It's crazy. 
I can remember it. It's the time Andre got arrested. We were in Omaha, Nebraska, and Andre had been, he was really pissed off. His back was hurting. Andre got arrested? Yes. There were some TV camera people there for the 10 o'clock news doing some filming. And uh, when Andre went out to the ring, the guy got the camera and put it right in his face and he pushed the so, guy. So now they bring 20 cops. But during that match, Andre had had enough of this warrior. So this warrior, bang, 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 and Andre's in the corner, and this guy's going to charge in, and when he did, Andre went. <laughs> Andre gets out of the ring, leave. Bobby Heenan was there, he tells the story too. Andre stuck his fist out, he'd run the mouth, boom. Gets back to the locker room, I remember I was there. Oh, they had 20 cops in there, but they did bring in the, like the lieutenant, the top guy. And he said, Andre, we got a complaint. We got a file. We got a file. That's part of the deal. All right. It was just a bad night that night. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you guys know what that is. That's a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit Eight, eight hours of driving north of Montreal right. and uh, in the boondocks. But anyway, uh, the show is over. We're, we're received in this restaurant pub and this guy comes out and uh, we're all sitting, me, Raymond, Dino Bravo and uh, Andre the Giant. And uh, this guy is drunk right. and he comes behind the Giant and he had a, three of his friends with him. I guess he just wanted to show off. So he comes in behind the, the, the Giant and he slaps him on the back. Right. Just a slap, like a friendly slap, but hard enough that we all turn around, like, and uh, and, and 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 Andre just like snap. He got up real slow. The guy started running outside. The three of the guys start running outside. They got into a car, which is called a Volkswagen. You know the Beetle, you yes. know the Beetle Volkswagen. Andre the Giant took the the, the car with his hands and he flipped the car over with right. the four guys in the car. That's incredible. He did that. He did that in front of Raymond and Dino and me. <laughs> it's something you'll never see in your life. But when we went out to the ring, his knees were so bad in his in his later days, and he had to he had to. There was like three steps, and he got right to it, and he looked at me. He goes, "I don't think I can make it." And, and I was like, "Put your hand on top of my head, it was like a crutch. He's me a crutch." And he's he's looked at me. And he looked for Sean, like, where's your partner? <laughs> and he did. He grabbed Sean and he grabbed me on top of the head. This is his own TV. It was actually a TV match. But he puts, he does that and gets upstairs. That's the only way he could get up to the ring. And and then in the match, we covered him. We, we you know, we took because he couldn't move good. Um, at that time, at the end of, you know, in the back room after that match, it, me in particular, Okay, I can't speak for Sean. I don't know what he said, Sean, but he told me, he goes, I apologize. You're a good, pretty good guy. And he's just what he told me. I'm not sure about your partner. <laughs> um, my first thing was, is, man, I'm getting in the ring. This old man, he's old. He's slow. He ain't going to be able to hit hard. Oh, this is going to be easy. And I, I remember getting in the ring and him grabbing me around my neck. And I remember his hands felt like it wrapped around two times around my neck. And I'm thinking, oh my God, he kind of backed me up into the corner with his slow big man walk. And he raised his hand up nice and slow. And wham, hit me in the top of my head. And I felt like a redwood tree just hit me in the top of my head. I'd never been hit so hard in the top of my head by an old man. But I'm telling you, it definitely was an experience of a lifetime. Did you get the chance to go out with him at all and see any of these drinking stories that we heard? I never had a chance or the opportunity to go out and actually see him, but I got a chance to experience from Narita Airport to the hotel, seeing him drink a case of red wine from the hotel, from the airport to the hotel, which is about an hour, hour and a half ride, give or take on traffic. And by the time we got to the hotel, I'm going to say he had three bottles left out of 24 and wasn't even drunk. I, I get a call from Bill Watts. He says, uh, Brian, uh, uh, Dusty's coming in and Andre's coming in and they both want to ride with you. And um, I know you got the big blue Continental. They know that. So I had a big baby blue Continental in 1972 that I, you know, I had in high school. And uh, it was still running good, except the air conditioning, I mean, the heater didn't work. 
and we're in Jackson, Mississippi, and it's January. So I'm thinking, wow, um, what am I going to tell these guys? You know, I got two of the greatest superstars in the world getting ready to ride in my car. Two guys that I really are like my heroes, you know, and I'm not going to have any heater. What do I say? And so we meet at one o'clock at the hotel in Jackson. And the sun's shining, it's probably about 40 degrees with no wind. I remember Dusty had a long sleeve West Texas sh uh, State shirt on and, uh, and a t-shirt underneath. Uh, Andre had a white t-shirt with a Y of A up um, and his uh, buttons were unbuttoned. And so I forgot what I had on, but uh, I felt totally warm. So I wasn't really thinking about it that much. And Dusty goes to me, he goes, hey, beep. I said, yes, sir. Mr. Uh, yes, sir, Dusty, and uh, your dream, whatever, um, trying to be as respectful as I could. And he said, uh, listen, um, I need you to go to the liquor store. I said, okay. And uh, he said, listen, um, the giant, giant drinks a lot. You need to get him uh, two bottles of Crown Royal. Get him the big ones. I said, yes, sir. He says, get him a case of Budweiser. And he said, get me a case of Lone Star. And uh, you drive and you can have a six pack. I said, okay, thank you, sir. So he hands me a few hundred dollars, uh, and he keeps talking to me. He says, don't forget a cooler. Get a cooler. And he said, get a little cooler. It might be cold. We may have to pee in a cooler. And he said, uh, I got a McDonald's cup uh, in my room. I just bring the cup um, and whatever. And I'm listening to all this, these things he's throwing at me, but I didn't want to forget. I'm what, hoping he's not pissing in the cooler with the beer still in it. What, what liquor what <laughs> liquor to get? Uh, so I got all the liquor, get, loaded it all up, did everything like clockwork. We're leaving at 3 o'clock. It's 220 miles north to uh, uh, Jackson, uh, I mean from Jackson to Greenville, Mississippi, 220 miles north. So we take off. It's cold. It's getting colder. And i am got my defroster on. My defroster works. And so the window is clear and I'm just listening to these guys and it's it's great to be a fly on the wall in the car with the American Dream and Dusty Rhodes. I mean, how much better does it get than that? So I'm listening like crazy and they're, they're laughing. So I'm laughing and it's a lot of fun and it's getting a little colder. And I'm waiting for them to tell me to turn the heater on and they haven't said anything yet. And Dusty's already drinking a half a case of beer. Uh, Andre's drinking a half a case of beer and a bottle of Crown Royal, and we're not quite at the building, not quite at the building yet. And uh, we finally get to the building, and as their their stories were so interesting, the weather changed so dynamically on the way up there. By the time we got there, there were there was snow on the ground. I mean. It, it dropped below zero, so there was no more snowing. It was just ice. It was cold. And uh, Dusty says, hey, Beat, he says, listen, uh, uh, make sure that car's hot. We, we're not going to take a shower tonight because one last. We're just going to head out of here, and we're going to hit the road. I said, yes, sir, I'll be ready. So I was on, uh, like, second and uh, second or third, and I uh, jumped in, took a quick, quick shower, ran back to the car. Um, it started up the car and I'm trying to, I got the defroster on just hoping for any kind of heat and in my body heat just anything please help me because I know they're going to be freezing so they come out with the tights and everything I, on still dressed and towels around them and <laughs> so they jump in the car and they're laughing sweating uh, give me a beer give me a beer, beer so the Dusty's in the back seat you know, he's he's riding uh, in the back seat, right in the middle, and uh, I'm I'm driving, and Andre's right here if you're looking from the back. So Dusty's right, right in the middle, and he, him and the Giant are talking. What do you think about that? I'm, I'm listening, I'm listening. You know, and everybody's, now they're starting to pee. We're about 50 miles down the road. That cooler's starting to f fill up with pee. Um, I had about, I don't know, three, four beers, so finally I peed um, in the McDonald's cup, and we just pass around this small cooler. <laughs> and so then the, then, the, then the giant peed in the cup and he, he how uh, could the giant pee in just a cup without I, he, overflowing <laughs> he, was a big cup, but yeah. he did and uh so he pees in the cup and uh they're throwing beer bottles out the road and uh crown royal bottles uh, you know he i know that there was only this much left in the second crown royal bottle that andre had and we're 50 miles still from uh, Jackson, Mississippi, on the way home. And he's going, God damn, people, it's cold in here. And I said, I oh, know, no, I got the heat on the best I can. I don't know why it's not working so good. 
And Andre's going, whoa, 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 whoa. He's, he's like so full of alcohol that he can't feel anything, but he's laughing. It makes total sense, and it's great. So um, anyway, we're laughing some more, and uh, uh, Andre's got to pee again, and uh, Dusty grabs the cooler. He's uh, got it on top of his lap, and somebody said something that was really, really funny. And all of a sudden, Andre goes like this and laughs forward, and when he goes backwards, my seat in my Lincoln Continental pops and it falls back on Dusty and that cooler busted wide open on his lap and it's oh it's that got all that hot urine over his whole body <laughs> and he's he cuts the world's worst promo on me or the best promo I mean he was calling me everything but a but a man I mean he was calling me all kinds of names and god damn people you're blackballed you'll never work again you just embarrassed the dream in front of the greatest superstar the two greatest superstars in the wrestling industry Andre the Giant watched you piss all over me I can't believe you did that people I said I didn't do it I didn't do it I didn't do it and Andre's laughing so hard so you know we get back and Dusty's mad at me for the next uh, a few days